Sean would face down here, and I'm with the legendary Roger Merritt, uh, who is well known for Agnostic Front, but is here with the disasters today. Uh, how are you doing today, Roger? I'm doing good, Sean. Thanks for asking me. On the road, doing what I do, I guess, busy. I can't wait to get home to my kids, three more shows, but then I gotta go again ten days later to Europe. Uh, that's life. That's now, this interview, don't feel you know you have to hold anything back. If you need to express yourself, by all means, uh, if you don't censor it, uh, you can say what's on your mind. Now, what made you decide to start the, the disasters back in 1999? Well, basically, I was, you know, I'm just a musician. I'm very creative. I love writing music. And I was just writing a bunch of songs and just kept writing. And then towards, uh, I think it was 2000, the guys in AF decided they wanted to just go a little bit back to their, wanted to get another guitar player, kind of start doing the stuff we were doing towards the late 80s, early 90s. But I was still writing. And I just kept blogging it. And I, I mean, I wasn't, there was never an intention to start a band of disasters. So I was basically just writing. I was just going to put out my own solo stuff just because I feel like I would. I just wanted to get it out there, and I had something to say, something to do. And then when I recorded that album, it came out so good. It was, I remember it was me, Reese Kimmel, still plays with me, Johnny Cray from the Crays from New York City, and then Johnny Rio, who plays the Street Dogs now. After recording, we were like, wow, you know, we, we just dug it so much, and we just said, let's just be a real band. And that was it. That's the system. Excellent. Now, 2006, you guys parted with Hellcat, um, and you signed to Sailor Grave Records. Why did you guys decide to leave Hellcat? Well, we did two records with Hellcat. We did the self-titled Roger on Disasters we did in 1984. And um, I don't know. I just felt like let's try to change. You know, sometimes change is good. It's necessary. It's part of growth. You know. Dave, it's your drum kit. So um, we moved on to say it was great. And the unfortunate part about that is as soon as we, we our record came out so it was great, they went bankrupt. So then that record kind of fell in between the cracks because nobody knew the sale was great, it just went under. So it kind of sucked, you know, for us. But we were, we signed for sale, sales grave in America, in Europe, we signed with a label called People Like You Records, PLY, who is a label we're with right now with our new one, Gotta Get Up Now, but internationally now instead of just in Europe. Now, um, you've been in the industry now since the mid-80s with Adonis Front, and you've co- you know collaborated with a bunch of legends in the industry like Biohazard, Jamie Josta, Tim Marsh, Rancid, and many, many, many more. And you're labeled as the godfather of Miller Carnacore. Did you ever think that you would actually come to collaborating with this and being labeled as the godfather? No, I, I never looked at it. I never thought so. You know, going back to what you were saying, we, we've been advanced since 1981. So before some of the fellows you mentioned us collaborating with, we were we were hanging out with other bands. Where, for instance, like you know the early the, the earlier punk bands, the Discharges, the GBHs, the, all, all the early minor threats, the Control. You had all then when all the metal started crossover started happening, we were hanging out with bands like Metallica, Slayer, Exodus, Anthrax. You know, like then you know at, in '86 was our second record. Was it 86 that came out here across the line, which was considered pioneer, what they called crossover, metalcore, same thing they called it years ago, what they call it now recently, I don't know what they call it. But we've been doing, you know, we've just been doing stuff we love with a bunch of people that, you know, were great musicians and digging it, you know, vice versa. Now, what are your thoughts on when uh, the closing of CBGB happened in 2006, and how did it feel playing the final show there with the Agnostic Front? Well, Hilly Crystal, owner of CBGs, had called me up and said, hey, Roger, you know, we, prior to that one last show, we had played, we, I remember playing a show with Carnivore, which is, yeah, Carnivore played that in Whiplash. It was Whiplash, Ignacio from Carnivore. That must have been 1986, around that era. It was the first time CBGs was closing. Actually, we played one before that. So we've always been saving CBGs' ass somehow. And um, Hilly was like, yeah, I really want you to play the last official New York hardcore band name, which which he gave it to me. He said, I want you to put it together, and I picked the band, did a great little man I uh, I invited Sick of It All, I invited uh, Matt Ball, um, Harley's band, Harley's well played, you know, we're just 
blew it out. It was awesome. It was the last official matinee at CBGB's. He went on to do another show at like the Bad Grades on the plane at night, but that was just a regular night. It wasn't a, a matinee. You know? nice. Now, speaking of Madball, how, how is it having a brother uh, in a like, successful hardcore band as well? Is there any like sibling rivalry? Not like you guys oh, are fighting or nothing, just like trying to like, compete against each other oh, as far as band goes? Absolutely not. If anything, my brother, I mean, we're, we're family first of all, so that we never did that, never, never will, you know? Um, my brother's very appreciative of everything Mad, of everything Nuts Friends have been done for Madball, basically creating the band. From creation, you know, we all played in that ball, and um, <coughs> he went out to take it, which is what I love about my brother. Is that, you know, he was always had to live in the in the ghost of Big Mouse in front of him, but he went and took it to his own level, to his own band, and uh, and which is, you know, I very respect. I'm very proud of him to do that, and we still always work together. This last record uh, and the one previous, this last one, um, my ride, my way, for the Agnostic Front, and. And uh, Warriors, prior to that, he, he produced it. You know, nobody knows Agnostic from better than my little brother. He was since when he was seven years old, he was singing with us. You know, so he knows. Excellent. Now, what what is the inspiration behind your newest album, which was just released in uh, January? Got to get up now. All right, I'm a little confused right now. Is this an interview for Disasters or Agnostic from? Uh, both. I don't care if it's both. Like, I'm kind of losing where I was going right now because I started talking about Gnostic like, Front. All right. Well, what was that again? <laughs> the uh, inspiration behind your newest album, uh, which was just released, Gotta Get Up Now. Well, what's interesting about the disasters, and it's really cool for any true Gnostic Front fan, is with the disasters, it's like reading, like reading my personal diary. And lyrically-wise, if you read that, it, ta- it talks of all the York of me prior to the Gnostic Front, me in the Gnostic Front, and nothing but the glory days of the punk scene. Lyrically, it's, it's, it's a genuine diary. You know, people really want to know who I am, what I am about. Read those lyrics, buy those records. Musically, it's a collage of those bands that inspired me to to do a band like Agnostic Front or to become a punk rocker back in you know 1979. These are the bands musically collage hints of all these bands. It's nothing new, but it's refreshing, and I'm hoping. I'm hoping that with the disaster, I could do the, I could inspire the youth like like I was inspired back then, but like by listening to these type of music with these kinds of songs and these kinds of messages. So it's kind of cool. It's 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 very personal. It's very different than agnostic front. Yeah, and even the live shows, it's still a lot of energy, but it's definitely more in the rock and roll, more in a sing along rock and roll type of tip. Yeah, know? when when people ask me who do you like better, agnostic front or the disasters, and it's like it's kind of hard to say because it's. It's kind of a an ignorant, ignorant question. There's, right. there's no competition. There's no one you should like better. I mean, who do you like better, Picasso or, or uh, 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 um, Mike Bind? You know, Mike Bind. Two different types of artists. Right. You can't say who's better. It's a preference. You know, like you know what you like. It's a different it's a preference. Uh, both bands have just as much passion for everybody in the band, and both bands love everything they do. And there's differences. Like I said, you know, if you want to know more about me and all New York and you're not all your old early stuff, get the disasters. You're reading my diary, it's just personal to get. The agnostic front isn't that personal, it's a little bit different, you know. But I, I you can't say what's better, it's kinda of, kind of hanging out. Exactly. Now being in the in, in the industry as long as you have, you must have some crazy fan or core stories that actually stick out. Is there anything you'd like to share? Man. <laughs> Um, that's a tough one because like I said there's a lot I'm trying to think of something on this tour that one up I just got out I just finished driving and just switched with him about an hour not even an hour but like 20 minutes ago I'm a little burnt out anything crazy I was just talking about all these crazy I mean like I, I remember I was just re- I was just on Highway 80 every time I get on Highway 80 I remember about about you know having like doing stupid things like pulling over the side of the highway, setting up drums and having drum offs with my roadies and drummers, and or just getting off the band and fighting with the guys. I fought everybody in the from people being so frustrated, like pull over, we're gonna fight, and stuff like that. You know? Now, how does it make you feel that your music inspires and helps so many people through a lot of hard times and struggle in everyday life? That makes me feel good because you know I never got into this 
movement to um, never believe in the whole rock and roll thing. I despise all that. And I know about pretty much the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's nothing I really wanted to be into. You know, I kind of that's why I, I love the punk scene. It kind of spoke more to me. Like bands like you know, the Clash, Joe Strummer really has something positive to say, something good to say. I've always was raised with respect. My mother always taught me to respect women. You know, and I don't believe in in, in, in that kind of stuff. I was just never into that. So like, I took it to the level of, in, in, with all my lyrics, is that, you know, I just was writing about how I felt. And basically, a lot of them would speak about like overcoming like the justice system or overcoming like a you know a, oppression, you know, an oppression and overcoming it. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. You know, like I think in a hundred years, if you find victim of pain in a bottle somewhere and you put it on, you'll feel just like that 100 years from now as, as I did 100 years ago. And what was really crazy about it is I got to experience the fact that the world feels the same. You know, this oppression is something that's a worldwide thing. It's not just a thing that happens here in New York. And then people related to us so so spontaneous, so easily because, you know, they knew we were, we were genuine. We knew we were our passion. You could hear it when you meet us. You could, you could feel it. And they kind of relate to it. Like, I mean, this is as simple as black and white, but it's something I can get into. You know, who wants to be a part of something that's not real? It's genuine. You know, do you want to be a part of something that's not real? No. So when they feel it and they hear it, then they want to associate to it. Now, do you guys have any pre-show rituals that you do before show? No, no, there's no goat swinging. Or, there's no crazy shit going on. We just play, man. We never did. It's funny because I see all these bands, you know. It started years ago, like, especially with all the straight-edge bands and stuff. It started like they were all stretching and jumping around, a little bit of gymnasium or some kind of a crazy weight and everything in the world. Like, what's going on here? And then they would go play, you know. They just want to puff up and just retard it, just play. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing all these bands that do these prayers and these rituals, like you say. Like, like that. Yeah. All right, no, man. <clears throat> now, is there anything special you'd like to share with your fans? No, when I go up there, you know, I just, I do my thing, man. It's every every day it's different, you know. I, I just, you know, it's like, I'm just really passionate about it, you know. I just, I don't like bullshit very much, you know. And I get it back from the people, you know. There's nothing special, special, and I just tell them how I feel, what it is, and talk about my songs, and tell them a little story, whatever. But most of the time, I just go out there and I just perform. I just play. And it's weird because people that know me personally, like, can come to my house and hang out with me, and then they see me on stage. They're like, oh, "Is that you?" Like, you know, because I'm really a really quiet, reserved person. I always have been. You know, I've always been very polite. You know, very respectful. I was like, yeah, I grew up that way. Now. And I just believe in do unto others as you want done to you. Like, well, why should I be a, an asshole or a rock star or a jerk? You know? I wouldn't want to deal with someone like that, you know. So I wouldn't do that, you know. So I've always been like that. And like I say, I love being with my family. I love my children. I love my wife. I love my mom. My brothers and sisters. You know, I've had a good life, and thank God. You know? Now, punk rock has a lot of political views. Uh, what are your views as a punk rock band in uh, modern day society? Punk rock is interesting. You know, like, I hate those people that are like the kind of the punk rock police and they want to tell you, like, what's right, what's wrong. Even back then, we've always said, you know, be yourself, you know, like, no rules, basically. You, know, you shouldn't go by it. You, you shouldn't do things because everybody else is doing it just to fit in. I, I appreciate a person that's just kind of walking out and just doing his own thing, you know. And, and a lot of the punk rock today, and um, it's been acceptable. It's not as uh, like what it was back in 1979, early 80. Like, you were a punk rock, you were fighting, you were, it was dangerous. There was nothing about it that anybody understood. Nazis versus colored ones all the time. Yeah. <laughs> if you were, if you were, had tattoos, nobody understood you, nobody talked to you, people you generally cross the street, you're walking down the street, you're sure. And they want to come up to you and talk to you about tattoos. Yeah. And blue hair in 1981 was not cool. <laughs> you know, and today it's 
socially acceptable. You little boy can go to school with eight years old, boom, here, it's cute, even a mom. So, I mean, time has changed, and what can you do? I mean, a lot of that's past, we lived it, we survived it. I have a lot of friends that didn't make it, you know, or locked up. I've seen a lot of divorces, I've seen a lot of deaths, you know, and I'm grateful that most of us that are here with us, and at the same time, I'm really grateful that it's, it's kind of okay for people. I don't want to see people suffer the way we did. We, we had it hard, man. I mean, fights back then, it was, it was hard, it was hard. People didn't understand. I'm kind of grateful about that, but at the same time, sometimes I think it's too easily given to them, and they take it for down, you know, like, I mean, they take it for, um, for granted. Kind of frustrates me because I see stuff that would have never flew years ago. So why is it flying now? Like it's okay. certain things are okay, but you know, like the way sometimes people behave is like so easily. You know, it kind of frustrates me a little bit. But I'm like, well, whatever. You know, in a way, it is what it is. People will eventually, you know, eventually you you would have to answer your own questions if you know what I mean. So. And last but not least, what is the future for the disasters? We know that you just came out with that new album. Any other tours, videos? Uh, what can your fans expect? Okay, there's a new video for Outcast Youth soon. A friend of mine shot it. As I can say, a lot of friends of mine have been doing stuff for us. We don't have any money. Um, I did another video for one of my favorite songs on the record, which I wasn't going to put on the record, but Reese. Reese taught me to do it, which is Junior. It's a very oddball song. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't work with a lot of it. But it's not the first time we've done oddball songs. But this was straight up a country song, you know. But it meant a lot. I wrote that for my son. I woke up out of my dead sleep, and my wife said, what are you doing? She was, he wasn't even born. She was, you know, she was like, laying, she was like seven months pregnant. I was like, I want my mom to write a song for my unborn son. And that's how Junior came out. So, um, it was a special song to me. I kind of did a little video for that. I can't wait to put it out anyway. I know, you know, a lot of people, they want to put you in corners and keep you in corners. But you know what? I mean, a song is a song. A message is a message. Creatively, where you use it, sonically, it's up to you, you know? To me, it's always been about the lyrics, never about the music. The music complements it. And gives it that edge. I mean, if a mouse in front, for instance, was from anywhere else, it probably would never sound the way we sound. Uh, vice versa, even with the disasters, it definitely has a New York edge, you know. You kind of put it in that corner, you know. But lyrically, it's the most important thing. And that song is very important to me. It's a straight up song written for my, my own family, you know. And is there a future for the Nelson Front on top of that? Absolutely. I mean, even when I'm going back to the disasters, we've got a new, uh, a, uh, a new uh, single out with us, which is a reggae redo, and we're going to find a way by Chuck Treese and DJ Stretch, which is really cool. And uh, we've done that before, uh, 1984, I think. You know, my right had a little ring remix right in there, too. Um, let me see what else we're doing with the disasters. We're going to go on tour right now to Europe, and then we're going to hit the East Coast. And we already talked about new songs. we got about 12 songs already. So we got it. Just find a time to do it. It's going to come quicker than last time. It took a long time because I moved from New York to Arizona. I've had two kids since then. It's been a lot going on. And then again, I also had the new agnostic front record, My Life, My Way, which is an amazing record, too. I mean, I mean, when I did the Disaster record, I was a little bit worried about the agnostic front record because I love the way the Disaster record came out. I was like, damn, now I'm not going to top that. But, you know, I bought it up. I bought it, too. You know, we all stepped up. All the agnostic front guys stepped up and did a great record, My Life, My Way. It feels our best. It's a combination of Warrior meets some kind of game. It's got a lot of sing along It's cool. And I also did a single with the Alligators. I don't know if you forgot the Alligators. Just recorded it. That was the last thing. We recorded September. Last September we recorded Disasters. Uh, November we did Agnostic Front. And December I did the Alligators. The Alligators stuff still not out yet, but it's, it's the best single yet to do. So I've been busy and a little worn out, tired. We're also working on my cars and my hobby and my life. So there's a lot. There's a lot there. You know, I'm not giving up. None of the bands have given up. There's going to be a, uh, a tour with the Agnostic Front here. I'm sure we'll play, play around here some Denver for sure in, in September. So look for that. Yeah, I'd definitely like to come and take some photos of you. You'll be more than welcome. John Freeman is the same person you'll be talking to about that. And um, yeah, man, I'll be here, man. I got a lot of friends here in Denver. So I'm looking forward to the show tonight.
I do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out the, the disasters, definitely do. These guys smoke and rock. And also check out the Yashikron as well. <laughs> and Clover has to get in there too. Awesome. All right. Face down is out.